Hello everyone, it's Lindsay, and today I'm back with another word study for you guys. Not on Wednesday like it should be. I took a little bit extra time with this study after I had started it. I just needed some time to sit on it before I got this video together for you guys and wanted to just do a good job at sharing um, my notes and my study with you. So if you're not familiar with word studies, I will have a few videos linked down below for you guys. This is a whole series that I've been doing for a long while now. Um, so there's plenty of content. I also have a tip Tuesday specifically on word studies, sharing some of the different resources that I use, how I navigate the Blue Letter Bible app, strong Concordance, things like that to pull these notes together. I have gotten some questions about where I get these printouts. These printouts I actually put together with my study. So I have compiled a few different resources, um, a MacArthur Study Bible, uh, Blue Letter Bible app, Strong's Concordance. I introduced the Vines uh, Dictionary into this week's study as well. I'll have that linked down below. There's a couple different options. There is an app. Uh, it's a little clunky to use, but it has some really great information that you'll see in the study today. And so I kind of compile things from all of that and put together my own notes as I work through the study. I'll I'll also have a resource to gotquestions.org to go along with today's word that will be linked down below as well. So this week I did a uh, Bible journaling process as I'm continuing to work through the Living Stones devotional kit. Uh, and so I will link that down below also in the top right hand corner here. And I had mentioned that um, one of the words I was going to look at this week was the word confession. We looked at the story of Isaiah and his vision, uh, the seraphim that brings the hot coal to his mouth, uh, and this, this process of God uh, cleansing him and preparing him um, for service to the the Lord. And that started with Isaiah's confession or acknowledgement of sin in his life. And so uh, I thought that this would be a really good kind of tie in with this week's Bible journaling process. So again, if you missed that, you can catch that down below or in that top right hand corner uh, card. And so uh, initially, like it seems like every time I sit down for one of these, I sat down, kind of had an idea, thought it would be super simple. And then it was not. There was quite a bit of study. Uh, I am working with the Word Focus set three cards from uh, Open Journey. Uh, she does have the Greek and Hebrew word, though I will go into some alternative ones for this as well. And then she has a list of scripture for us to look at in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, looking at uh, ways that the word confession is used throughout the Bible. And I love using these cards because um, there is some guidance. Um, Ingrid is pretty intentional about the verses that she picks and kind of uh, how they tie together, but it's really open-ended. It's just a blank card. And so you can kind of just go wherever, you know, God takes you in that study. And um, this was one of those particular studies. And so I do want to preface this by saying, I didn't think that this was going to be a controversial word until I started studying and looking at it. And so I know that there are people who come to my channel who follow me that are from a variety of faith backgrounds. Uh, I come from a Protestant Reformed uh, background, and you don't have to completely agree with me. I don't have to completely agree with your secondary, you know, beliefs. Um, but there is, you know, one truth when it comes to salvation. Jesus is the only way. Um, there are some fundamental things um, in there. But uh, this may be, you know, I may have a different perspective on this than some other people might based off of their faith traditions, I would encourage you to stick with me through the study. That is one reason I really love doing these word studies is because it either, you know, brings new things to light for you or confirms beliefs that you already have. And I really, truly believe in, you know, us exercising our muscles to be able to study the Bible on our own so that we know what we know. We're not just taking what we are being told. I mean, we can trust our pastor. I hope that you can trust your pastor. And, you know, certain theologians or people that you follow and listen to and commentaries and things like that. Um, but we really need to have a grip on the Bible that we own ourselves. And so we need to be able to study to either, you know, affirm what we are being told and what we believe and let the, the scripture confirm that. Or maybe you will be, you know, enlightened to something that you've been told or believed your entire life just because it's been passed down in your faith tradition. But then when you take the time to go through and study 
at scripture on your own and see what scripture is teaching, it may, you know, reveal something different to you. And so that may be the case with this word uh, confession. And so I would just encourage you, hang with me, go through the study. I will assure you that I looked at this from a variety of perspectives. I go into it, looking at it from my particular reformed background. Um, but knowing that I have, um, specifically with this word, a lot of Catholic followers as well. I do go over and look into that perspective as well. Uh, so I, this is something I've done even before I was a believer. I've done this with any topic that I look at, whether it be, you know, social, political, <laughs> religious, whatever it is. I like to look at it from different angles because I don't want to just accept what I'm being told. I want to come to my own conclusions. And so with this one in particular, I did go to some other um, perspectives and look at it from that way and ultimately go back to scripture and see what scripture says um, about this. And so I assure you, I've done my due diligence when it comes to my study. And so uh, I would encourage you to do the same. So not to scare you off, but I just know that this may be one that, you know, people just have differing uh, traditions when it comes to. So talking about the word confession. Uh, she has the New Testament and then the Old Testament listed. I flipped that and went to Old Testament first and then the New Testament. And so I've done my study just a little bit different. As I've been doing um, studies with my women's group um, in my local church, we're doing an, an inductive study through 2 Corinthians. Um, they've introduced me to some new resources. I've kind of um, worked with the Blue Letter Bible app just a little bit differently. So there's different things that I pull out of it now. Um, and so you'll see that this may look a little bit differently. So looking at the word confession uh, for the Hebrew, that's the Old Testament, that's H3034. Um, the word for that is yada. Uh, and so the Strong's definition for this is uh, in the literal sense to use the hand to hold out, uh, physically to throw a stone or an arrow at or away, especially to revere or worship with extended hands going along with that, um, you know, to hold out the hand, intensively to bemoan by wringing the hands, cast out, make confession, praise, shoot, give thanks, thanksgiving, thankful. So a few different ways to uh, look at that. I thought this was really interesting, this, this intensively to bemoan. I mean, when we are confessing our sins, we should be, you know, grieved by our sin. And so this, you know, kind of is that physical manifestation of that, that wringing of the hands, wrestling with it, um, but then also throwing it away, getting rid of it, turning away from it. That's repentance, right? So I've started listing out some of the different words that are used um, for this particular Hebrew word. And so the Strong's Concordance in the Blue Letter Bible app does list the different words in the English translation that are used and how many times those appear. So actually the word confession you'll see used as the word praise, give thanks, confess, thank, make confession, thanksgiving, cast, cast out, shoot, and thankful. So I wanted to kind of highlight that just so that you can kind of see some of the other ways that, you know, when this is translated, um, that that is used. I thought it's very interesting that 53 times it's used as the word praise um, as far as confession. So this, you know, can be looked at it in that way. So one of the scriptures that she has for us is uh, Numbers 5, 7, but I went ahead and included Numbers 5 through 7, just so you could kind of get some of the context um, when looking at this. It says, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel. When a man or woman commits any of the sins of mankind acting unfaithfully against the Lord, and that person is guilty, verse 7, then he shall confess his sin, which he has committed, and he shall make restitution in full for his wrong and add to it a fifth of it and give it to him who he has wrong. Uh, John MacArthur says in reference to this, a sin committed against God's people was considered a sin committed against God himself. This is a really interesting perspective to take on just sin in general. When we think about our sin behavior, but specifically when our sin is enacted upon another, whether that be, um, you know, lying or coveting or, um, you know, various different sins that involve another believer in Christ, we're not just sinning against that person, we're sinning against God himself. And in the same way, when we sin, sinning against God, God cannot be near sin. He is a holy God. He cannot be near it. And so when we commit a sin act, it is not just affecting us. It's just not just affecting the person that we're sinning against. It is a direct 
you know, act against God himself. And I think when we think about sin in that perspective may change um, kind of how we think about it. And hopefully it grieves our heart even more about uh, our sin behavior, knowing that it isn't just affecting us, that it is affecting others and God, um, you know, would hopefully lead to confession of that sin and then ultimately repentance, a complete turning around 180 degree of our life away from that sin behavior. She also has Leviticus 5.5. And so it shall be when he becomes guilty of one of these things that he shall confess that in which he has sinned. Uh, John MacArthur says that confession must accompany the sacrifice as the outward expression of a repentant heart, which openly acknowledged agreement with God concerning sin. Sacrifice minus true faith, repentance, and obedience was hypocrisy. So when you just go through the steps, you know, especially when you're looking at the Old Testament where they actually were following the law and having to physically sacrifice animals as payment for their sin, if they were just to show up and, you know, not confess what their sin is, not acknowledge their sin, they're not fully, um, you know, dealing with this sin behavior. They're just kind of going through the steps. There needs to be repentance. There needs to be confession. Um, That is really, really important in this entire process when we look at confession. David Guzik says to confess meant one would agree with God that the sin was wrong. So looking at it from God's perspective, being in agreement with him, you know, again, he is that holy God that cannot be near sin behavior. He hates sin. Uh, And so, you know, we talk about a loving God, a gracious God, a merciful God. Yes, he's all those things, but he's also a wrathful God. He is a holy God. He cannot be near sin. And so if we confess, that means that we're putting ourselves in agreement with God, that we are also hating that sin in the way that God hates sin. Meyer, another theologian, says, uh, he quotes, confession is taking God's side against ourselves. It's the act of judging evil in the light of the throne. So when we look at that story in Isaiah chapter 6, um, that vision that Isaiah had, it was opened up by seeing the uh, seraphim worshiping God, holy, holy, holy. Uh, and so, you know, in response to Isaiah seeing the holiness of God, he immediate was just a confession of his own sin. So when we look at the holiness of God, it should be exposing our sinfulness and we should be grieved by that. And we should be taking God's side against ourselves. God hates sin. We need to remember this as we're looking at um, the importance of confession. David Guzik says that the proper confession of sin is a neglected practice among modern believers. There's a lack of serious recognition and confession of sin, both to God, we see this in 1 John 1, 9, and that would be one of the scriptures that we look at, and to others, James 5, 16, another scripture that we will look at today. We don't need to confess to a priest, but for the sake of honesty, humility, accountability, and cleansing, more confession of sin should be made to one another, as in James 5, 16. So this is going to be a first little peek into maybe some differing views on this word confession and the process of confession. Um, And I hope at the end of this, after we looked at the scripture in the New Testament, um, you'll have an understanding of why I come to that um, with David Guzik saying that we no longer need to confess to a priest. Uh, I will link the um, gotquestions.org article that I read um, down below. There are even more Uh, scripture in there kind of pointing out um, why that is and the biblical referencing for that. Um, Confessing to a priest is not sinful. There's nothing wrong with it. But this idea that you can only confess to a a priest, that only a priest can forgive you of your sins is not truly biblical when you look at the context of that. And so, um, but there is evidence of confessing to one another. Um, We as believers in the New Testament, the new church, we are a um, holy priesthood. We are made priests um, when we become believers and that we see uh, scripture for that. And so there is this reference in James 5, 16 about confessing to one another. Um, And as we get into the New Testament, we'll talk about that. So there's nothing wrong with confessing to somebody for accountability, but that true confession ultimately needs to be to God. And he is the one that forgives us uh, of our sins. Uh, let's see. So, um, just my own little note here, we need to be in community with one another. That's kind of the process of confessing with each other. Uh, again and again, we see, uh, scripture referencing the importance of being in relationship with people, uh, other believers in Christ, that there is a purpose for that. There is this, um, you know, 
iron sharpens iron, that we need to hold each other accountable, build each other up. Um, We don't need a priestly gatekeeper now that we have Jesus to intercede on our behalf and the Holy Spirit within us as our helper. So if you study the New Testament and really truly look at what happened with Jesus's sacrifice and the, the us receiving the Holy Spirit, the entire kind of set up of the Old Testament and the things that they needed to do, going and bringing physical sacrifices to the tabernacle, um, the priest having to go through the whole cleansing process so that he can enter the tabernacle so that he could go and be in the presence of God and intercede for us. That is no longer needed. Jesus sits at the right hand of God. He is there to intercede on our behalf. Um, No longer do we need that priest as that in-between for us to have communication with God and to, to, um, you know, get right with him as far as our sins and when it comes to confession and things like that. Again, I would highly encourage you to take a look at that resource that I have down below. I know that there's going to be differing opinions about that. I can assure you that I believe what I believe and believe that the Bible supports it. So I appreciate, you know, commentary and discussions down in the comments, but I have done my due diligence in my own personal study, and this is where I have landed um, on this particular situation. So looking at the New Testament, the, um, I so- shortened it to the word confess. That's G3670, but we're actually going to be looking at a few different um, versions of this. So for the G3670, it's homologeo. Uh, and so it's actually from um, two two different words. So this is really interesting when you look at the breakdown of this word homologeo. It's from the G3674, which is homo, which is the same, and then G3056, logos, saying, or word. So going back to what we're looking at in the Old Testament, that we are in agreement with God about our sins, right? That we're looking at sin behavior the same way as God. We're in agreement with his word and what he says about sin. Same saying, same word. So um, the definition in the New Testament is to assent. Um, For example, covenant, acknowledge, confess, profess, confession is made, give thanks, uh, promise. Uh, This is to admit or declare oneself guilty of what one is accused of. So being in agreement with our guilt, the fact that we are guilty. This is the the first step of confession is acknowledging the sin, acknowledging that it goes against uh, God's plan for us and that there are specific things that he has marked out as being sin behavior. We need to acknowledge that and then declare that uh, and confess to him our sin. And and we'll go into details like how that needs to be detailed. So some ways that this word is used in the New Testament, you'll see is confess, profess, promise, give thanks, confession is made, and acknowledge. The Vines Vines Dictionary kind of goes and breaks it apart into uh, the different ways it's used in the the verses. And so it says, and it also kind of gives you a general uh, definition, I should say. So the general for the G3670 version is to speak the same thing. Remember, homos, lego, to assent, accord, agree with. So that is looking at this particular word. Now, for 1 John 1, 9, uh, the Vines Dictionary says, to confess by way of admitting oneself guilty of what one is accused of, the result of inward conviction. So now when we think about that definition, we look at 1 John uh, 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous so that he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John MacArthur says that continual confession of sin is an indication of genuine salvation. While the false teachers would not admit their sin, the genuine Christian admitted and forsook it. Confession of sin characterized genuine Christians, and God continually cleanses those who are confessing. Rather than focusing on confession for every single sin is necessary, John, here in 1 John, has especially in mind here a settled recognition and acknowledgement that one is a sinner in need of cleansing and forgiveness. So this is kind of uh, in a general sense. Now, I kind of had to wrestle th- with this for a moment because as I was going through this study, and I've been told and I'm taught, and I know this, that we need to be, you know, continuously confessing our sins to God, repenting of those sins. We are sinners. Um, he, you know, Jesus died on the cross and was a sacrifice to cover the punishment that we should receive for our sins, but we are still sinners and we're going to fail. Our flesh is going to win some days and we are going to 
fail constantly. Um, that's just part of living in a fallen world. And so as I started thinking about this, I kind of had to wrestle a moment because yes, we, we know Jesus died, you're saved, he covered your sins, your sins are forgiven. But then how does this process of continual confession, continual repentance, not turn into a works-based salvation? Because I do not believe in a works-based salvation. Uh, I don't believe that we need to earn our salvation. I do not believe that you can lose your salvation once you are true. When you are a true believer in Christ, you cannot lose that. There's plenty of scripture evidence that he holds you, maintains you, that your hope is secured. Um, you know, and there's talk about those who have turned away from him and aren't saved. It's because they never truly were saved. Um, um, and so how does this not become works? And so I actually had to stop and have a conversation with my husband about this and kind of work this out in my brain. And this is similar to works of faith and that this is in response to. It's in, it's in uh, thankfulness for what has been done. It's not that we are have to do this to maintain our salvation, this confession of sin and repentance. This is not um, something that we have to do to maintain our salvation. It's what we do because we are aware of our salvation. We are aware of what has been done for us. And so it's in that response. And so when you change that in your mind a little bit, hopefully that will kind of um, work through workspace salvation and how that, you know, that's not really, it's not about what we can do. We cannot earn our salvation. And so we're not confessing our sin to earn our salvation. We're confessing our sin because we've been saved and we now acknowledge the holiness of God and that he cannot be in the presence of sin. And this is part of the sanctification vacation process, right? We have been saved and now it's just a continual day after day, moment after moment, becoming more and more Christ-like. And so there is work to be done in our life that doesn't change our ultimate uh, salvation, our ultimate um, eternity with Christ. But this is while we are here, there needs to be this constant refining of um, ourselves and becoming more and more Christ-like. And to do that is the sanctification process. It is this confession of our sin and repentance um, and and turning away from that sin-filled life. And so it is a constant process, but not because that earns us our salvation. Once again, that does not help us maintain our salvation. Um, it's in response to what has been done for us. And so I hope that kind of helps you in the way that it helped me. Uh, gotquestions.org uh, says, he will not condemn our souls as if there is no hope for there is no longer any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1. The spirit's conviction within us is a movement of love and grace. Grace is not an excuse to sin, Romans 6, 1 through 2, and it dare not be abused, meaning that sin must be called sin and it cannot be treated as if it is harmless or inoffensive, we can't just sit in our sin behavior and, you know, acknowledge the the grace that God has and just go, well, we're forgiven, so I get to live my life however I want to live. You may not be truly a true believer then if that's how you are living your life. If you are choosing to just live in the sin and stay there and not have a transformation of your life, there there is some, some things to be concerned there. Um, as just as God is graceful, he is wrathful, and he is holy. And we need to remember that he is all those attributes fully, 100%, all at the same time. Unrepentant believers need to be lovingly confronted and guided to freedom. And unbelievers need to be told that they need to repent. Yet let us also emphasize the remedy, for we have been given grace upon grace, John 1, 16. Grace is how we live, how we are saved, how we are sanctified, and how we will be kept and glorified. Let us receive grace when we sin by repenting and confessing our sin to God. Why live a sinful life when Christ offers to make us whole and right in the eyes of God? There are consequences for our sin. Now, if you are a believer, you, you're going to have moments of sin. I sin every day. Day. Um, and there will be consequences. Um, there's various different things that could be um, strife in my marriage, strife with my relationship with my kids. Um, I think one of the commentaries look at, even looked at um, illness, not that illness or sickness is always a punishment for sin behavior, but it could be tied to sin behavior. If you are living a gluttonous life and you have a sin of gluttony and you have health 
issues because of that, that is a direct result of your sin behavior. Uh, and so, you know, there are, there are consequences to that. Now that does not change that you are saved. Um, that is secure, but th- that doesn't mean that God doesn't still um, want us to deal with the sin in our life. So moving on um, from Matthew 10, 32, uh, the Vines Dictionary has this definition to think about as we look at this verse. It says, to declare openly by way of speaking out freely, such confession being the effect of deep conviction of facts. So when we look at Matthew 10, 32, it says, therefore, everyone who confesses me before people, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. So here's where we look at some of those differing uses of the word confess, you know, our personal confession to God of our sin, but also confessing the truth, confessing to others who Christ is. Uh, John MacArthur says the person who acknowledges Christ as Lord in life or in death, if necessary, is the one whom the Lord will acknowledge before God as his own. This is part of being saved. We must confess, right? With our mouth, believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and Lord over our life. Uh, Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Uh, John MacArthur says, not a simple acknowledgement that he is God and the Lord of the universe, since even demons acknowledge that to be true. You can see that in James 2, 19. This is the deep personal conviction without reservation that Jesus is that person's own master or sovereign. This phrase includes repenting from sin, trusting in Jesus for salvation, and submitting to him as Lord. This is the volitional or acceptance element of faith. We could go down a whole entire another study on this when we talk about, you know, that what it means to become a believer in Christ, to become a Christian, to receive our salvation. Um, This is even something I am kind of studying and learning even recently. You know, I have been in places where they do the sinner's prayer, you know, the whole group, raise your hand, repeat the prayer after me. Oh, yay, now you're saved. Not necessarily. This is saying that even demons acknowledge that, Jesus is Lord. If there is not, there should be a transformation in your life because you are submitting to his authority. You are recognizing the sin in your life. You are turning away from that prior life and turning a life that is in submittance to God. That need, You need to see that evidence um, in some way um, to be a true believer in Jesus Christ. So moving on down, now looking at 1 Timothy, Timothy 6, 12, we're actually going to look at a slightly different variation of um, that word confess uh, that we first looked at here for G3670, homologeo. Um, now it's going to be a noun, G3671, homologia, which is a confession by acknowledgement of the truth. So just a slight variation of that word doesn't doesn't totally change it, but it is a little bit different. Uh, 1 Timothy 6.12 says, Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So again, looking at a slightly different usage of the word confession here. John MacArthur says that uh, Timothy's public confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, which likely occurred at his baptism and again when he's ordained to the ministry. Um, And so there was a lot of talk about baptism as we move into these next few verses. I did not include those commentaries because I I just, it really would have made this even longer. And you're kind of mixing a whole lot of different things there. Um, And so I wanted to kind of keep it on track with with this confession of the truth, confession, um, being in agreement with God's view of our sin, confession of our sins to him. So for the vines, uh, for the verb version of this, G1843 is exomologeo uh, of a public acknowledgement or confession of sins. So exo, outside, right? Um, we This is outside acknowledgement. Uh, Matthew 3, 6, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. So they were confessing publicly and being baptized. Mark 1, 5, and all the country of Judea was going out to him and all the people of Jerusalem, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Again, this outward confessing. So here's where we're going to kind of transition into the idea of um not just confessing to God, and that is the most important, but also confessing publicly our sins and and with other believers. So John MacArthur says, to confess one's sins as they were being baptized is to agree with God about them. John baptized no one who did not confess and repent of his sins. 
All right, James 5, 16, and this is where we're gonna kind of wrap things up, says, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. A prayer of a righteous person when it is brought about can accomplish much. So now we're going to look at our horizontal relationships and how this confession plays in. Um, John MacArthur says that mutual honesty, openness, and sharing of needs will enable believers to uphold each other in the spiritual struggle. Uh, David Guzik says that James reminds us that mutual confession and prayer brings healing both physically and spiritually. Confes confession can free us from the heavy burdens, physically and spiritually, of unresolved sin and removes hindrances to the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, confession to another in the body of Christ is essential because sin will demand to have us to itself, isolated from all others. Confession breaks the power of secret sin. Satan loves nothing more than to shove us in a little hidey hole corner in the dark depths of our home and make us believe that we are all by ourselves and there's nothing we can do um, and just feeding that sin behavior. Once that, you know, we see scripture, it says, you know, light and darkness, light versus darkness. And so our sin needs to be brought into the light so that it can be exposed and be gotten rid of. Um, and so by confessing to one another, holds us accountable, helps them also be there to support us. It's a lot easier to walk through um, repentance and, you know, this process of turning away from that sin behavior if others know about it. And this um, deals with maybe another sin that we might be dealing with, which is pride. Part of our reason for not wanting to share our sin behavior with others is we are prideful. We don't want them to think differently of us. We don't want to be embarrassed. We don't want, you know, we don't want that to come to light because Satan doesn't want it to come to light, right? Because then it can be dealt with. But if we overcome that, bring it to light, uh, and you are in a healthy church relationship that you have um, a good foundation of fellow believers around you that uh, can come alongside you and help support you through that um, you know, process of repentance and turning away from that sin behavior, that is so, so important. And you're going to be more successful if you have that. There is a reason that God emphasizes these horizontal relationships throughout the Bible. Um, yes, we need, we have the whole Holy Spirit as our helper. He is there to help us. Yes, there is God. He is 100% capable of dealing with that on his own, but he acknowledges our flesh and our need to be in relationship with other people. And when we do that, we have that assistance of fellow believers. Uh, this uh, Edwin Orr, I didn't, haven't taken a lot of commentary from him, but he had this very interesting kind of list um, of ways of dealing with confession, I guess, especially when dealing with, um, you know, this, this that we're talking about in James 5, 16, confessing to one another, um, confession should be made to the one sinned against. So first off, if you have sinned against somebody else, it's, it's, it, it's not enough to just pray quietly at home. God, I confess about this sin. We need to deal with it. Really. We need to go and confess the sin that we have, you know, confess that to that person we've sinned against. We need to heal that relationship. Uh, and part of that process is confessing and not just, I'm sorry that this made you feel this way. I'm sorry that you didn't like that. I, no, I am sorry that I sinned against you. I can't tell you, I have personal experience with this, with a pastor who sinned against me and he did not approach this in the correct way at all. It was, I'm sorry I made you feel that way. I'm sorry you felt that way. I'm sorry you perceived it that way. Rather than coming out and saying, I'm I'm sorry, I sinned against you and this is not right. Um, and because of that, that relationship was never restored. And ultimately the relationship with that church was never restored. The, there's many of us that ended up leaving because, because of this. Sin destroys. I mean, I don't know how else to make it obvious how terrible sin is for us and how much God hates sin. There's nothing good that comes out of sin. Uh, confession should often be public, going back to that, you know, to have the support of others, to make, to, to make us more vulnerable. You know, when we are weak, God is strong, right? He can, it's, it's more apparent of God's work when we are at our weakest moment. Um, public confession must be discreet. And this is talking about immorality sins shouldn't be shared in detail. We see this in Ephesians 5, 11 through 12 says, do not participate in the useless deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them for it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. So when it comes to sins of immorality, we need to exercise some discretion about that when we are confessing publicly about that, um, or if somebody else is confessing publicly about that, it does not need to become, it almost becomes another sin when you are getting, you know, gossipy 
or entertainment from hearing about somebody else's um, immorality. And so we need to be careful that that sin doesn't lead to more sin behavior. Uh, distinguish between secret sins and those which directly affect others. So our own personal sins versus, you know, sinning against somebody else. Uh, confession is often made to people, but before God, there needs to be prayer. God needs to be at the center of this. Uh, confession should be appropriately specific. So again, kind of tying in with this discretion, you know, we don't need to go into every single nitty gritty detail, but we also can't be super, super general and just, I've sinned. Okay, but what is sinned in what way? Sinned against who? Um, confession should be thorough. We can't just gloss over it. We have to dig out every little bit of that sin out of every nook and cranny and get rid of it. Uh, confession must have honesty and integrity. One need not fear that public confession of sin will inev inevitably get out of hand. Um, you know, God and the Holy Spirit are at work and we are following the guidelines and doing what God has planned for us when it comes to confession. He works in that and make sure that it's not going to become some, you know, out of hand, crazy, you know, situation. Those who hear a confession of sin also have a great responsibility. If somebody comes to you and confesses their sin and is asking for your accountability, asking for you to be praying for them, asking for you to get down in the pit and come alongside them and walk them through that, um, this is a great responsibility. One, we do not want to fall into that same sin behavior. We don't want it to cause us to sin in our own ways. We don't want gossip. Um, we don't, you know, all these different sin behaviors that we can have in response to that. Um, it's it's a great responsibility to be a fellow believer and to have somebody come to you um, with in trust and confidence. And, um, you know, we need to be building that person up, pointing them back to God, you know, getting into scripture with them, spending time in prayer. Um, there, there is some responsibility that comes with that. But I really loved this kind of outline of how to deal with sin. And so going back to one of those prior um, statements about um, the proper confession of sin is a neglected practice among modern believers. Uh, I think especially here in America, we're very much individualists, right? We like our freedom, do our own thing, kind of live in our little corner of our life um, and don't have so much of that community when community and relationship is such a huge part of Christian life. And so, um, you know, confession of sin is no different. We, um, there there is a purpose behind this in this outline of this. And so I hope this kind of was a good study for you guys and encourages you to maybe kind of dig, dig deep down into the scripture and, um, you know, maybe get some clarification on some things or, you know, maybe you've believed in a certain way and this kind of has caused some questions. Take this to your pastor first and foremost. And don't just, you know, if they're just spewing this is what we believe, but not giving you scripture reference, that's a red flag. That's a concern. Show me in the Bible where it says this chapter verse. I need to see where this, you know, says how we should do this. You know, all this needs to go back to the word of God. So I will link the resources that I use down below so you guys can kind of do your own study. I um, would highly encourage it. I know that this, this is a little bit different than some of the other word studies we do. And I always get a little bit nervous um, when I do these, um, but I think it's really important Lots of time was spent in prayer um, and really kind of trying to handle this as best as I can, not being a Bible scholar, Bible teacher, just taking the resources that I have and the time that I've spent in God's word and just kind of using that as a guide to share with you my personal study time. Um, so just remember that as you look at this, but there is a look at my study on the word confession. Now we're going to dive into um, the creative aspect. And so let me go ahead and um, gather my supplies and I'll kind of walk you through how I'm going to work through this particular word focus card. All right, so I've gone ahead and printed out the back side of the card. I just did it in my little Canva template with one of the focus verses. So 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous so that he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. unrighteousness. I thought that was kind of a good kind of encapsulate everything verse. I've got all my information about the word there, some little notes, and then that quote from Meyer, confession is taking God's side against ourselves is the act of judging evil in the light of the throne. And so that will be for the back of my card. And then as far as the front, it'll be fairly simple. I have one of these backdrop papers from Tim Holtz. Uh, I think this is from volume two. I'll have it linked down below. Uh, that makes for like a quick and easy background. I have a couple of die cuts from the Living Stones devotional 
uh, kit. I like this idea of like, these were meant to be, you know, our, like words of God wrapped around the stone being wrapped in scripture. But I kind of like the idea of thinking of these as like our confessions and then tossing them. Uh, there was that for the Old Testament version of confession, uh, this definition of to throw a stone, an arrow at or away. So this idea of, you know, writing down your confessions and throwing them away like a rock is going to sink with them. So I've got those. Uh, and then I wanted to create an envelope where I could add prayers. And this might be a little bit vulnerable to write down some of those confessions, but um, I'm using this uh, die postal from Sizzix and Tim Holtz that has this envelope. And then there's this piece here that cuts out a piece that fits in the envelope. Uh, I'm not sure if this is still available. If it is, I'll have it linked down below wherever I can find it. But there's lots of little envelope templates online and different resources like that where you could just trace it out and cut it out so you don't have to necessarily have the die. But uh, I went ahead and cut out the envelope from some of the dyed paper that I had in my stash. Again, I will link that little tutorial down below. And then I cut a few uh, little letter pieces from some dyed uh, index cards that I had in my stash. But then I also uh, cut a few of them from one of these uh cards from the Living Stones kit. These are meant to be sized to fit in a traveler's notebook page. Uh, and so you could just use it as a decorative element or cut pieces out of it. So I actually cut a few little cards from that and they're just blank on the back side, so I can write on the back side of those. And those are all gonna tuck into that envelope that's on the front of my cards. So a little bit vulnerable, but a great way to, you know, get those down, confess those sins, have them, you know, written out and start praying over them and things like that. So that is what's going to kind of be the gist of putting things together. I do want to mention this is a new stamp set. I have been linking to the smaller version of this one, but I recently got the worn text, like full size uh, version of this. And so this is a great option if you're looking for some uh, numbers that are kind of similar, similarly sized to what I've been using. Here is that Strong's Concordance number. So you can see how that is going to fit at the bottom. They're just a really good, good size and they are slightly larger than the ones that I was using before. So I'll have that link down below as well as everything else that I'm going to be using. We're going to be just doing a little bit of stamping and kind of adding some details to these elements. So let me go ahead put you guys on fast forward and we'll finish up this card for the word confession. All right, so whenever I'm adding a paper to the background of these cards, I usually initially cut it down to four inches by four inches, and then that allows me uh, room to tear off the bottom edge about a quarter inch, and that's the perfect fit for the back of this card without covering up the words at the bottom. And I like to have that torn edge just so there's a softer transition between the background paper and the bottom of the card. And then I can just go in and round my corners to match the cards. And super, super simple. You don't really have to do much else other than that, but I am going to add some gesso uh, to this paper just so it's not quite as dark. So I'm masking off the bottom of the card with some mint tape and then going in with my brayer tool and some white gesso. I am working on that new uh, Ranger silicone mat that I've recently gotten. Uh, there's pros and cons. It dog fur sticks to it like crazy embossing powder sticks to it like crazy, but it is nice that it's really big and it grips a hold of things. So that card kind of sticks to the mat while I'm working on it, which is really nice. And the ink pad, like you see here, I'm inking up the edges of the card with some old paper distress ink and my ink pad isn't moving around my desk. It's sticking to that silicone mat. So I don't know. There's some good, there's some bad. I'm verdict still out on uh, if I prefer this over my other craft mats. But moving right on along, I am going to assemble this envelope piece. Again, I did cut that out of some of the dyed papers that I have in my stash, and it's really simple to adhere together. I know some people prefer uh, double-sided tape to put that together, but I, I just use liquid adhesive for everything, and I'm just really careful to not use too much. That way it doesn't seal the envelope uh, completely shut. And before I stick that down, I am going to add a little bit of detail to it. So I've pulled out a huge stack of my Open Journey uh, stamp sets, and I'm just going through and using them to add little details. So stamping some of the seals. Later on, I'll come in with some of the florals. And so this is a great way to just pull out your stash of stamps and use maybe some stamps you haven't used uh, in a while. 
I'm going to add a little bit of distressing to this envelope, just like I did on the back of the card, but I've switched to uh, brushed corduroy, which is a brown colored ink, and just kind of roughly inking up the edges of that envelope. This is helping to define everything, so everything will be, you know, kind of distinguished from each other. Uh, same thing with these stone die cuts, and then I'll go in and ink up the edges of all of the little paper pieces that go in the envelope as well. If you're not into grunge and dirt, you could use a uh, colored ink for this as well. And it just adds a little bit of detail uh, to these pieces. And it's a fairly quick and easy uh, detail to add. I am inking up the front and the back. Not that it, I mean, nobody's really going to see it, but me and now all of you that watch this, but it just makes it feel uh, complete. So for these two uh, kind of more plain cards, I am going to add some extra stamping. So I've pulled out some um, like of the mixed media texture stamps from Open Journey. And I am using archival ink uh, for all of my stamping just because I have them out on my desk. I've recently gotten the four pack of Distress archival inks. And so they're just a good color range. There's black soot, which I'm using here. Uh, the gray was hickory smoke. And then I'll use some vintage photo. And then there's also ground espresso. So it's a good range of a black, gray, lighter brown, and darker brown. Uh, it's really easy for stamping over mixed media um, surfaces. So the front of these cards, I'm stamping out Lord, I confess. I'm using that worn text stamp for the word Lord and then the little Matthew stamps. And I am doing that echo stamp where I kind of stamp the letter and then stamp it off a couple of times for a few of them. And that just, you know, kind of fills in the space and adds a little bit more texture to it. And then before I adhere things onto the front of the card, I'll add a little bit of stamping on here as well. Uh, this is where it's great to use that archival ink because there is some gesso on that card. The archival ink uh, adheres to that and dries. You can have some difficulty with pigment inks and things like that when you're stamping over uh, a gessoed background. And now I'm going in with some different florals and stamping those to fill in some areas. I'm not thinking about this. I'm not worried about placement. I'm just inking it up and committing to it and just kind of filling in the areas of the card. So now we can kind of start adhering some things down. I'm um, just using liquid glue to adhere that envelope directly to the top of the card. And that envelope is a really great size for the front of these word focus cards. And then when I adhere the stone ephemera pieces down, I am going to be very careful uh, with this one in particular that I'm not adhering it in a way that glues the envelope shut since it does overlap kind of the top opening of the envelope. I'm just being mindful of that. That way my cards will still fit down in there. And this die is created in such a way that it's a little bit of a loose fitting envelope. So you can fit chunkier pieces or multiple pieces down in that envelope. On the back side, I'll go ahead, or this this will be the back side. I'm stamping the Strong's Concordance number, and then I will adhere this card to the back of the focus card. It wasn't necessary to do this for this particular card. The mess did, the back didn't get too messy, but I just automatically do that just in case. Um, that way I don't have to worry about it. And then I just trim it to fit the shape of the card. And that is going to be it for today's word focus card. If you have any questions or comments, be sure to leave those down below for me. Also be sure to check out the description box below this video. I took plenty of time to try to link all of those resources that I mentioned, articles, websites, things like that, as well as all the products used today. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Subscribe to my channel if you're not already subscribed. And until next time, thank you so much. Bye-bye.